What's going on, gang? Today, we're going to have the conversation of redefining the American dream. And this is a conversation that needs to be had, because if you go ahead and put the American dream in the YouTube search bar, you will come across many, many videos where people are talking about opting out of the American dream because they feel that it is too hard to obtain. And it got me to thinking, because I did a video on um, the corporate game that was talking about freedom. And it got me to thinking, it got me to really start thinking about where most people are and we're going to talk about the institu institutionalization of the American people and why this prevents them from having a different viewpoint. So once again, if you're seeing this, I don't know what day I'm gonna put this up, but we have started the home economics course, which is the transformational course that you will, that will be required for you to take before we get into the business courses, because one of the things, because of this institutionalization of the American public, that people don't understand that they have to transform before they become a business owner and start making more money because what will happen to the new money is the same thing that happened to the old money. So the link is below. And also I transform uh, platforms because I was using one platform and something weird happened. So I just had to transfer to Teachable, but you can go ahead and get in that course link is below and it should be in the first comment. All right. So let's talk about what is the American dream. Many people talk about the American dream as if it is static, that it's just one thing. Now, for a long time, I bought into the typical American dream. Uh, someone made a comment on the corporate game talking about me not owning a house. And this is about the indoctrination of the American public. One of the things that like, I get these questions all of the time that Glendon, how much of your wealth is in stocks and bonds? And to me, <coughs> Hey Glendon, how much real estate that you own? And this is part of the indoctrination that for you to be wealthy, you must do these things. You must own real estate. You must own stocks and bonds. You must have investments. And this is the brainwashing that the American public has undergone because Grant Cardone, who is fantastically rich, doesn't own any stocks and bonds. He talks about it all the time. He owns no stocks and bonds. He owns income producing real estate and he owns it at a very high level. And one of the things that I consistently see is the box. If you're rich, you must be in this box. You must have the real estate. You must have the stocks and bonds. You need to have a 401k and I look at this stuff because let me explain to you how I got out the box. I used to own two houses and I was in participating in the stock market. And one day I was looking at my stock portfolio and I would realize that my stock portfolio had gotten to the point that it had gotten to because of contributions, not appreciation. Now what are contributions? Contributions are the money that you contribute to the stock market. Okay. Appreciation is that money that you have put in the stock market. The appreciation is your money working. And because I was putting money in the stock market so fast that my contributions were significantly higher than my appreciation or AKA my money making money. And I, I started, you know, cause I was, it was a, it was a, I was in my warehouse. I was at my desk and I realized I could make money faster than my money could make money. Let me say this again. 
I could make money way faster than my money can make faster. Like literally a hundred and in some cases a thousand times faster. And this was a life changing moment for me because I had an SBA loan and I had enough money in my stock portfolio to pay off my SBA loan. And I took that money, I sold all my stocks and I paid off my loan and got out of debt. And then, um, when my business partner, Francine, rest in peace, Francine died, I was such an emotional mess that I got rid of my houses because I didn't want to be responsible for anything. I didn't want to be responsible for two houses. And actually at one point I was responsible for three houses because I helped Francine's sister uh, sell her house and sell her car and sell all the possessions in the house. And it was just a really emotional time. And I realized, that I didn't have to do that. I was like, you don't have to keep these houses because both the houses had a loan on them. So I sold the houses, got from under those loans. And actually those loans are no longer on my credit report because after they disappeared sometime last year. And once again, stuff only stores your credit report after day the last activity, 10, maybe 12 years. Cause I think they stayed on my credit report longer than um, 12, 10 years. I think they stayed on there much longer than 10 years. But one of the things that I realized was I had a choice in the matter that I didn't have to own this property. I didn't have to own the stock. And I actually sold the houses and moved into an apartment. And this will sound strange to someone who is financially thirsty. You want to drive a nice car. You want to have a nice house, but you can't because you don't make enough money. Let's go ahead and just frame that. Just frame that. So here you are on the outside with your face pressed against the glass, looking at the inside, but you only can see because, you know, let's imagine you walking down the street, you saw a house and you went over to the yard and you looked in one room. So you're looking in this one room, but you're making assumptions of what's going on in the whole house. And you can only look in this one room. You can only look in this one room. And one of the things that I've come to understand, because as with communicating with you guys and having an understanding of where you are, and this is one of the reasons I'm doing the home economics course, because I have transformed. And with my transformation, my American dream has been redefined. I've already had the houses. I already have the fancy cars. I've already had that. So it's not important to me. And I don't mean to be dismissive. If you're hardworking, you're trying to get your credit score. You're trying to save up some money to buy your first house. I'm not going to dismiss or discount that. If that's something you want to do, knock yourself out. But for what I'm saying for me, been there, done that, not impressed by that. Because let me go ahead and tell you my, because actually, if you don't know, I've been kind of off since October. I just took a little time to ponder some things and I have redefined my American dream. It is not your American dream. I don't want to, like I said, I've already had the houses. I've already had this stuff, right? So currently I live in an apartment and you know what? I like it. Uh, the other day there was something going on with the garbage disposal and there was some going on with the sink and there was some going on with one of these blinds. I made one phone call. And within 24 hours, that was fixed. I did not have to call service repair people because here's the thing that when you own a house, you're responsible for a lot. And you may, if you have a new construction house, you're probably not going to have a lot of issues. But if you have an older house, the things that can happen with an older house can be staggering. The things that once you sign that paper on that mortgage and says, Hey, I own this house you become responsible for a lot of stuff that you may be unaware of. So I'm in a position where I don't want responsibility and the car business 
and I'll speak on that briefly, is one of the reasons because the car business, I had to be extremely responsible. I had to do a lot of things. I, and I just got mentally wore down from that. So I'm just like, you know what? I'm going to have a season where I don't have to be responsible for nothing. And, you know, there are people who don't understand that because they're outside with their nose pressed against the window and they want to get inside because I'm already inside. And, you know, at some point in the future, I'll probably have another house. But at this moment in time, I have no desire to have a house. I have no desire. Now, what I'm doing is focusing on my business. And one of the things, and you will learn this as we go on the uh, home economics course, that one of the things you need to do as an entrepreneur is get rid of distractions. There are entrepreneurs who are literally being held back because they have a house. And I don't mean this to say this in the pejorative terms, but they're being held back because they have a family. And we'll talk about why. When you have a house, when you have family, you have obligations. You have things that are already, part of your time is already spoken for. And this is why I really push and like, hey, as a single man, that is your time to build. That is your time to build. So you don't have to worry about looking after your children or taking care of your wife. That is your time to build. And typically, during these important years, typically your 20s, what are the most people doing? Goofing off, playing around, messing around, not anything productive. And then when they get in their 30s, it's like, now it's time to get serious. And then they get in their 40s, it's like, oh crap. I only have 15 years before I'm retirement and I don't have no money because here's the thing. And once again, I used to be just like you. I worked a job. I had a family. I went to work every day. I came home and you know what I did when I came home? I vegged out. I did not do anything productive. I did not do anything to change my economic situation. I didn't understand how to make money. I didn't understand how to start a business. I went to work and I came home. I watched TVs, played with the kids, listened to some music, had sex with my wife. That was my life for many, many, many years. I didn't understand that I needed to transform as a person to get from where I was to where I wanted to be. I had no clue. I was in a position where I didn't know what I didn't know. I, I didn't understand. I didn't know what I, I, I had no clue to how much I didn't know. I had no understanding. I, I was just like, because once, and what happened to me is I fell and I fell hard. I didn't bump my head, I busted my ass. I went from living a somewhat stable lifestyle to being thrown into homelessness, being thrown into economic unpredictability, being poured into being thrown into a situation where there's some days I didn't eat. I remember that there was days that my stomach would be because I didn't eat in two or three days. I remember I didn't have money for food. I didn't have money for something at the dollar menu at Burger King or McDonald's. I don't even know if they had the dollar menu back then. I don't even know because I wasn't going because I didn't have no money to spend. No money. None. I didn't have spare change. I had nothing. I remember one day, and this was before I had wrecked my car, that I was um, out and I, I ended up in front of a Burger King. And I wanted me a Whopper and some onion rings. And my wallet, I had like a dollar. And then I was like, and I pulled out my change, my ashtray, because that's where people used to keep the change. And I had a bunch of change in there. And I scooped that change out quarter by quarter, penny by penny, dime by dime, nickel by nickel. And I had $9.80 in the ashtray. And I took that change and I went into the Burger King and I counted all of that change out on the counter. And you know, there were people behind me that was annoyed because I was like, all right, that's a dollar. Because you know, I didn't have all quarters. So it would have been quicker, but I had, you know, a bunch of quarters, I had a bunch of dimes, I had a bunch of nickels, I had pennies, and my meal came up to like $8.80. So I counted all that change out there. And I sat in that Burger King 
and I ate my Whopper and it was delicious because I was hungry. I was starving and it was like the best Whopper ever. It was juicy. It was hot. And I remember those times. I remember those times of being hungry. I remember those times of not having any money. And this is where the transformation had to begin. First of all, I had to identify some root causes why I didn't have money. And there's the first thought, they don't pay me enough money on this job. That wasn't the reason. Um, I, I, they need to pay me more money. Um, there was all of these reasons that I came up. My ex-wife was a, the devil. All of these reasons came up. And then one day I had a very real conversation with myself in the bathroom of that boarding house in the mirror. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. The reason that you ended up homeless is because you didn't have any money. And it was just like, bam, just smack me upside the head. It wasn't this reason. It wasn't that reason. It wasn't because they didn't. It was like, then the second reason is I, at that time, did not know how to manage money. I did not know how to manage money. I did not know how to save. Uh, my credit was kind of shaky at that point. I don't even think, I think I had three credit cards and two of them were department store credit cards. And I didn't even go in there because I didn't have no money. And I think I was getting behind. I'm not sure. But I know I wasn't using a credit card. And this was in an environment when banks, this was kind of like a few years before this happened, banks started issuing a Visa debit card. And if you remember, if you had bad credit, you could not get the Visa debit card. They would give you a regular debit card that you could only take money out of the ATM machine. You could not use it to get point of sale purchases. And I remember I tried to get the Visa debit card and they told me no, because the lady was like, oh, do, do. sorry, Mr. Cameron, we can't do that. So I was in, not in the position to get even a Visa debit card, which they ubiquitous just give to anyone right now. So I know I wasn't using credit. I wasn't, you know, and this was my existence. If you didn't know, I used to work at Labor Ready and Labor, Labor Ready, and they were, I forget, they were actually, one was in College Park, and one was back over here on this side of the train tracks. It was uh, Labor Force, Labor Ready and Labor Force. And what these places were, were you would show up at 4.30 in the morning, and you would sign in, and you would take a seat, and you would wait for jobs to come in, day jobs, and they would come in and they would send you out. And at the end of the day, they would sign your sheet and then you would go back to labor ready or labor force, turning your sheet, and then they would give you a check, which you would go around the corner to the Chinese store to cash because regular banks wouldn't cash these checks. The Chinese store would cash them because they probably had a relationship with labor ready or labor force. That was my existence for many, 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 many years. And at that point, I honestly didn't even think about the American dream. You know what was the biggest thing for me during those period was just surviving day to day. I wasn't thinking about buying a house. I wasn't thinking about buying a car. I was just like, how can I work and make enough money to feed myself and to pay my rent? That was 90% of my thought process. And that's where the transformation came because here's the thing. I was so busy thinking about how to survive. I had no thought of how to thrive. It was like the total sum of my thought process was just making it. There was no thought process about growing, thriving. And this is when I had that conversation with myself. And this is when I had already been on the path of self-improvement and self-education. And this is when I kicked it up a few notches. And this is when I decided to get a job and to take that secondary income and throw it in the bank. I acted like I didn't even make it. And that was the beginning of my transformation because see, 
One of the reasons that I was successful as an entrepreneur was I never touched company money for personal reasons. So I have the ability to start a business and this is real, real important. This is real, real important that your business income is your business income and you need to have a secondary source of income that you can live off. I see it all over YouTube, people starting businesses and they're making money and they're living off the money and they are killing the growth of their business. They're absolutely killing it because it's very hard for you to live on the money and have enough money in the business to grow the business. It is really, really hard. So these people are handicapping themselves immediately. How do I know this? Because I've been in the game for a while. So I made that purse transformation and then I started to participate in what was considered the American dream. I got the business, I had the nice car, I had the houses and all this other stuff. And then one day I woke up and I did not uh, choose to opt out of the American dream. I didn't choose to opt out of it. I chose to redefine it for me. And my American dream is in the process of redefinition at the moment because who knows what the future is going to have? Because here's the thing. And this is the thing that I talked about in the corporate game video. I have unlimited freedom. I can choose whatever I want my American dream to be. If I want, like one of the things I'm thinking about, like I thought about moving to London. I don't know if I ever talked about that in the video. Uh, I've also often thought about moving to Manhattan Beach in California because I absolutely love the place. The food is delicious. The area is great. And I really don't know, honestly, what my American dream is going to look like in the next 10 years. You want to know why? Because I haven't made that decision. I haven't said I want X, Y, and Z. I have not put that on the map because like I said, I've been on break for the last five months, just mentally recouping from the car rental business and really just kind of like pondering the possibilities, um, getting in a relationship and learning and understanding that my American dream can be whatever I want it to be. And this is where a lot of people who opt out and I feel that the people who opt out of the American dream are operating on a scarcity mindset. When you operate from an abundant mindset, this is like, there, there's always money there. There's always options. There's always, it's just abundant. But when you operate from a scarcity mindset, you operate from, it's going to run out. There's not enough money. So since I operate from an abundant mindset and I operate from a financially resource environment, whatever I want the future to be, it can be. I just haven't made that decision yet because I've already been through a lot of things that people are trying to expire to. Like, honestly, there are people who are trying to expire to this apartment. There are people who would love to live in this apartment. And one of the things that I, once again, you know, I tell you guys everything and there's a whole bunch of people. It's like, you should have a house. You should keep a house. And all of these people who are telling me this, and I don't mean to be offensive nor dismissive. Don't have no money. And one of the things I learned a long time ago in my entrepreneur career, I don't listen to people with no money because they're operating from a scarcity mindset and I'm operating from an abundant mindset. So bam, that's going to conflict because one of the things that you need to understand into, uh, optimize is luxuries once tasted become necessities, right? And once you get to a certain level, you can't go back. I can't go back to the thinking that had me pawning my CDs and pawning my DVDs and pawning my car title. I am no longer that person. I can't go back to that. I sit back and think about when all this financially stupid stuff I used to do 
And I just shudder. I was like, who was that dude? There wouldn't like right now. I have no clue. I haven't even looked it up, but I can pretty much pawn. I know my Porsche car title probably. I don't know what they would give me because I haven't even looked or I haven't even run the numbers, but I have two assets downstairs in the parking garage that I know that I can get 150, let's say safely, because the, the BMW depreciated quite a bit. The Porsche hasn't depreciated. I can actually sell that for more money. Actually, we're still at, I would say I could get $180,000 to $200,000 for those two cars. And I've had them over a year. So I can actually sell those cars for what I paid for them if I wanted to. Now, this brings up an interesting thing because, you know, there's people here on YouTube who are selling their houses and cars because they can realize a financial gain. Um, I'm not selling my cars. I'm not selling, I'm not selling anything that I like and enjoy. I will sell things and I will get rid of things that I no longer enjoy or like. And this kind of brings up the house because there's so many people on me about this house thing. I got a question for you and please answer this in the comments. What is the nicest house that you've ever lived in? Please put in the comments, the nicest house, location, bedrooms, and how much this house cost because one of the things I have noticed is with my friends who are wealthy, when they would come over to the house, because they lived in an equally, nicer, an equally nice house or even a nicer house, they would come over and they would say the nicest things. They would be like, oh, I love this artwork. You know, they, they would be very, very nice. And then people who didn't have that would come in and be amazed. I don't know how many chicks came over and like, man, I would love to cook in this kitchen. They, they went nuts over the kitchen. And I've noticed that the people who had were very generous. The people who didn't have were, um, I'm going to say financially thirsty. I've noticed that because you know, people who have, you can like send them a text message. Hey, I just bought a new Porsche. And that's like, man, that's great. That's a beautiful color. I would never send that text to my friends who have jobs. I would never even bring it up because I've learned that I have to communicate differently with my tiers of friends. And one of the things that I'm learning, because, you know, I feel that this is really good for me. And thank you for your well-constructed uh, comments is to understand where you are mentally and financially. Because one of the things that I feel is hard for some people to absorb is because they're so financially desperate, they cannot see another point of view. They cannot imagine it. They cannot deal with it. They cannot understand it because they have been indoctrinated with this concept of the American dream and anything other than the American dream. They can't understand why someone would do it. I have a lot of people who are just, why would you go from living in a house to an apartment? That makes no sense. Once again, I operate from an abundant mindset. I operate from infinite possibilities. So for me, it makes sense. But to someone outside looking in the room, it doesn't make sense because if they were in that position, they would have a house. And let me tell you something about me and houses. I will never live in the hood. I don't care if it's gentrification. I have seen the prices of houses in the hood go from like, let me tell you a little story. Have you heard of Metropolitan Parkway? It's on the south side of Atlanta, right? It used to be called Stewart Avenue. 
I remember when these houses were going for not 50,000. I remember when these houses were going for five and 10,000 because the neighborhood was so bad. Back in the day, when I first got to Atlanta, you could roll down Stewart Avenue and you would see prostitutes literally from the beginning of Stewart Avenue to the end of Stewart Avenue hanging out on every corner. There was a little hotel that they tore down that where the prostitutes used to turn their trick. It was a bad, bad neighborhood. Prostitution, crackheads, drug dealers, all types of crime, right? Now this same neighborhood, um, God, 30 some years later, let me go ahead to the timeline, 1989, 99, 2009. Yeah, 32 years later, 33 years later, you got houses over there going for three and four hundred thousand dollars. And because the neighborhood has transformed, different people have moved in. And that's the whole point of this message is if Stewart Avenue can transform to Metropolitan Avenue and go from five and ten thousand dollar houses to three hundred to four hundred thousand dollar houses, you can transform. Because I'm telling you, the neighborhood is not the neighborhood that it used to be. Uh, number one, there are a bunch of white women living in that neighborhood. Not gay white men, but white single women are living in this neighborhood. Also in the West End. You will see that. And that's something you didn't see back in the day. So if a broke down, busted neighborhood can transform, why can't you? I've transformed. You can transform because one of the things that we have to understand and we have to acknowledge and we have to embrace is transformation is key. And this is going to be a cornerstone of home economics because I would not be here. And let me go back a little bit. I would not be where I'm at if I did not get that job. 26 years ago and save my money. I know here on YouTube, there are multiple YouTubers, savers are losers, where the average American could not get their hands on $5,000 cash. I'm gonna say 80% of Americans could not get their hands on $5,000 cash within 30 days. That is problematic. That is deeply problematic. Because do you know that if the average American had 5,000, not 10,000, not 20,000, not 30,000, just 5,000 cash in a savings account. Most of the crap that befalls the average American from car repairs to being ill to little incidents around their house, that $5,000 would cover most of it. Just 5,000. How do I know? I got laid off and I had $4,000 in my emergency fund and that was enough to get me through for six weeks and have money left over. I didn't spend the whole 4,000. So like I said, if the average American had 5,000 cash and let's go ahead and talk about this because there are things that get in the way of American dream and it's called the American consumption syndrome. You have people who cannot stop spending money just can't stop spending money. Um, they will go out like, I'm in this building and I see these shoes, which to me are ugly. Uh, they're called Balsalencia Bal or something, B-A-L-E-N-I-C-A. -E and they're these slip-on shoes and they're very expensive and I think they're really ugly. And you see a lot of people wearing Yeezys. And I'm just like, I don't like them. I'm not going to buy them. I'm not going to spend money on them because I don't enjoy these things. And this is where I, I will tell you, we have people around here who move out the building and instead of moving their stuff, we have an area downstairs where we take our cardboard boxes. And I have seen complete bedroom sets down there. I have seen complete sofa sets and dining room sets because these people took that stuff down there versus moving it out because they didn't want it anymore. But 
once again, I, I, I'll make some judgments here. I'm seeing stuff down there. I'm like, why are you living in this building if that's the kind of crappy furniture that you have? I know I said that, and that sounds very judgmental because for me, once again, there's proportion. I would not live here if I had to struggle to live here. I wouldn't. No, 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 no. If it was a struggle for me to live, I would not be here. If, if it was pressing me or it was, I wouldn't be here. It makes no sense to pay this type of rent and to struggle and to barely have the stuff that you need. It makes no sense whatsoever. So for me, financially, I have a sense of proportion. I wouldn't have bought that Porsche if I couldn't pay cash for it. Because once again, for me, it doesn't make sense to have a $2,500 or $3,000 per month car payment. Don't make no sense to me. I could do it, but it makes no sense to me. Because one of the things, and this is one of the things I teach you in Home X, is you have got to live with inside your income. You've got to live with inside your income. You cannot, like, uh, one, one, part of one, one part of training I haven't done is called a 50% solution. When I got to the point when I was able to live on 50% of my money and the other 50% was left over, that was the game changing moment of my life. That was the game changing. No one, no one here on YouTube even talks about that. I think one well-known YouTuber talks about being pathologically cheap and not spending any money. I will say that. But for me, when I got to the 50% solution, I was making, because at the point, at that time, I had a business partner. I was making, because um, I had a partner, and most months we would average 40000 There were some months that would be less than that, and there were some months that would be way more than that. But I was doing about two fifty a year, and that's where I came up with the corporate citizen number of two fifty. Two fifty a year, because at two fifty a year, I was able to literally save half easily, because even with two houses and I had a renter in another house, so I wasn't paying that whole mortgage. But you know, actually, I think at the time I was living on about three thousand dollars a month consistently because I didn't have a car payment, I didn't have any credit card debt. So I was able to put a lot of money into the stock market, like a ridiculous amount of money. And I know one year I put $120,000 in the stock market in one year, 120,000. And I wasn't dollar cost averaging. Well, I guess I could, cause it was like each month I put $10,000 in the market. And once again, I remember one year, the day that I was at my desk, I had been doing that about four years and I realized that because when you do, when you look at your investment calculator, it will give you what your contributions were and it will give you your appreciation or the money that your money made. And my stuff was all out of whack because I was putting like six figures in the stock market, but I wasn't making six figures a year. I was thinking I was making, 10 to 15,000 a year, 10 to 15,000 with appreciation. But I had a business that was putting $15,000 a month in my pocket. So, you know, and I just had that conversation with myself. I was like, okay, this investment thing is not working out. And if more YouTubers actually had significant investments, and they were able to do the math and crunch the numbers, they will come to the same conclusion. Um, one of the things that people don't seem to understand is when you're self-directed and you can think independently, you're not wedded to a socially pushed narrative, you're able to actually think. You're actually able to think because I'm about to go somewhere to the left over here. So stick with me for a minute. We're, we're about to take a little ride. I was watching my boy, Alan Roger Curry. If you don't know who he is, he's got a, he's a dating coach and his patented um, methodology is mode one. 
which is to let women know instantly that you want them in a sexual manner. And he was saying some stuff in this video because he was talking about how people were saying that he would not be that bold or sexually aggressive and he wouldn't. And I understand why he does it because he said something. He said, I'm about to tell you something. Y'all want to hear this. If you don't understand that speaking to a woman in that type of aggressive, sexually raw nature, you don't understand how many women that turn on. If you're the type of guy, your girlfriend going to get fucked by someone else. And he did this in the video the other day. And I 100% agree with him because, once again, I'm not going to go into the dirty details. I have a whole other channel for that. But I found out many, many, many years ago being that sexually bold and aggressive and suggestive got me a lot of pussy. A lot of pussy. Did it, every woman I used this on, did it work? No. There were women that told me, uh, no. Mm -mm, ain't happening. But my success rate was much greater because, and this is something I'll get into in, on Disruptive Mail because I'm not going to get into it over here, but many women, that will turn them on. More women than you know. And this is, this is one of the reasons I believe Alan because I've had those kind of experiences. And this comes from a socially contrived narrative that all these girls are good and you, they want you to treat them super nice and to be super sweet. Uh, I'm going to say something. For many women, that would bore them to tears. They will like it and they will go for it for a minute, but long term, it will bore them to tears. You know, because I'm like I said, I'm not going to get into it over here. Um, but that is the majority thought of the average man in America because they don't know better. They don't know the experiences. And this kind of goes back to redefining your American dream. Uh, when you are an independent critical thinker, the American dream is well, the, the, the pushed American dream, the push, the, the, the college degree, the house, the wife, the two point, that's well within your reach if you're an independent critical thinker. But if you're just um, an average guy, just out here following, if you are, and this is something that Earl Nightingale pointed out. He said, if people were actually following the, fo the leader, that's not bad. But he said, the people are following the follower. You're not following a leader. You're following someone else that's following someone else that's following someone else that's following someone else. And this brings back a story from many, many years ago. Um, there was this girl and she was in the kitchen with her mother. And she noticed that her mother cut the ends off of the ham before she put it in the oven and bake it. And she said, Mom, why do you cut the ends of the ham off? Because it, it could easily fit in a pot. And she said, this is something that I saw my mother do. So next time they were with her mom, they asked her, why did she cut the ends of the ham off? And she said, that's what I watched my mother did. So they went to visit great, great grandma. And they said, Grim, great, 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 great grandma, why did you cut off the ends of the ham? And she said, because it, so it would fit in the pan. Because I didn't have any bigger pans. <clears throat> she would have to cut the ends off of the ham so it would fit in the pan. Because she had a small pan and they didn't have money to go out and buy pans. So great, great grandma was doing something that was practical and made sense, but the, the daughter and then the granddaughter started doing the same thing because they saw her do it without an understanding of why she did it. They just did it because they saw her do it. Following the follower. Following the follower. Because if the little girl hadn't asked that question, she would have grown up and she'd been cutting the ends of the ham off and put them in a pan that she could have easily put the ham in. See, I, I know it sounds really, really simple, but... The lack of critical, independent thought is all over the place. Let's go ahead and 
let's go somewhere. My dissenters are the people who don't like me. They are not doing independent critical thought. If they feel that they can find an angle, they will go ahead and leave a dissenting comment that is devoid of any critical or in-depth analysis. I saw this comment on uh, the House of Pain, and this guy's like, you know, I watched the video and I did some research, and it got left like a three paragraph long comment, and it's like, based upon my research and watching what you said in the video, you didn't break the law. You didn't break the law. But once again, we have people <clears throat> who are following the suggestions of someone, and my girlfriend, she saw the video, and she saw the after video, so she said, you didn't say any of that. Once again, my haters and dissenters and people are devoid of critical independent analysis because anyone like Alan Roger Curry, shout out to Alan Roger Curry, he did a whole video talking about, based on what he said in the video, he didn't break the law. But many people are coming around with saying, He's a, you raped these children. Never in my life have I raped anyone. I got some stuff on my platform that you have to pay for that go into deep, 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 deep detail on some of the stuff that went down. And I'm just sitting here, the lack of critical independent analysis <clears throat> is one of the reasons that so many people are opting out of the American dream because they don't understand that you as a person has the ability to de redefine the American dream for you. They don't understand that, so they're like, I'm gonna opt out and I'm just gonna sit around and be a bum. They, once again, like the American dream today, in my opinion, if you're willing to do the work, is easily achievable. It's easily achievable. And it's actually pretty low hanging fruit pretty low hanging fruit, but so many people are jumping out of it because I feel with the pandemic that a lot of people actually had time to sit down and think and contemplate and to um, understand that their life has no meaning to understand that they're just existing from day to day, to understand that their life has no purpose. And that's a very empty, demoralizing place to be. It is really, because I don't even know what that feels like, because every day my purpose is to come here to provide independent analysis and critical thought on the Institute of Economic Thought. My purpose is, is to create courses to help people manage their money better, my purpose is to create courses to teach people how to start a business, make more money. I have a purpose. I have intent. So I don't sit around going like, I'm going to opt out the American dream. Go to do hard, man. It's too hard. It too, it too, 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 it's too hard. It's too hard. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's not hard at all. But the thing is, for the people who are opting out the American dream, I'm going to say something, and I've said this about Timothy Ward, not to be dismissive or overly critical of Timothy Ward. This is my phraseology that I use. Timothy Ward and people like him are wired differently. And when I say that, I say that with the most appreciation that I can muster, because once again, we're about to make a detour from sexual proclivities. There are people who are wired differently. I'm about to say something that you don't want to hear. There's some women who get off on being slapped. I know you don't want to hear that. I know you don't want to believe that, but these women are wired differently. Like the Timothy Wards, the Sheeta on the Loose, the Upgrade, all these other people making these videos talking about I'm opting out of the American dream. They are wired differently. So I don't think that for the average person who is wired the way that I would say a normal person would be wired, that opting out of the American dream is, ain't even on the table. They're gonna keep working hard, they're gonna keep doing what they need to do. And once again, if you are working on your credit score and you're working on your down payment and you wanna buy your first house, 
knock yourself out. I would say wait until 2023 because the market's going to have way more inventory and you're going to be able to get a better deal. Like seriously, just keep renting this year and wait to 2023. February, March of 2023, you will be able to get a house 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars less than what you can get it for now. And in terms of getting the mortgage, that's huge. That is huge. Huge, huge, huge. It's going to make a big difference in the price, even if the mortgage interest rates are higher because the houses will be cheaper. You will not get in the situation where you're going to be underwater on your house. So if you can wait, you know, if you can wait, I would suggest that you wait or you're going to be in that house for 10 to 15 years because if it, the market crashes or corrects like I think it will, you're going to have to wait until that house is in the position where you can actually sell it for more than what you pay for it. But once again, the American dream is on the table for anyone who wants it. But you have to understand where you are. And to achieve the American dream, you don't have to be rich. You don't have to be rich. You have to be financially stable, but you don't have to be rich. So hopefully, let me know your thoughts and opinions on this video, because uh, today I got to get into some teaching and training. And once again, the link to the home economics. And once again, I was using one training, pl one platform, and it got kind of hanky. So I switched to another platform and um, that link is below because the home economics is the transformation course that you should take before we get into the business courses. And this is March. So we're going to get into the business courses in April. So one again, you know, because March, we're going to be talking about transformation, about managing your money and things you need to do before you become a business owner. This is Glendon Cameron. Let me know what your thoughts and opinions of this video is in the comments with your well-constructed comments. And I will see you guys in the next one.